Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our message this morning, which is the third message in our series that I've called, This is Your God. And the message today is entitled, You Can Know Him. You can know Him. We're going to end up with Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. But as we think about getting to know God, the way we get to know God is by studying His attributes, His character, and His characteristics. God's attributes are those character qualities that uniquely define who He is and what He is like. And I pray that this series will be inspirational and will motivate us to a lifelong pursuit of knowing and growing in our love for God. May we conclude that there is no one else like him. As we read in Exodus 15 verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? This series will help us not only know about God, but to know Him more intimately and personally than we have ever before. Let's keep these three truths in mind as we go along. The first one is this. All of God's attributes are eternally permanent. That means they have always belonged to Him and they will always belong to Him. Secondly, all of God's attributes are inseparably interconnected. In other words, each attribute is part of the whole nature of God. But these attributes are not like slices of pizza, where we can just choose the one we like. God's love and wrath, His mercy and justice, His holiness and patience are continually functioning in a perfectly integrated yet infinitely complex way. The third thing we need to keep in mind is this, and I'm going to say this twice because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Some of God's attributes are unique to Him, while other characteristics can be passed along to us though in a limited way. Let me say that again. Some of God's attributes are unique to Him, while other characteristics can be passed along to us, though in a limited way. Here are a few of God's incommunicable attributes. In other words, they are not passed on to anyone else. These include his self-existence, His transcendence, His omnipotence, His omniscience, and His omnipresence. Now here are some of His communicable characteristics. Things that by God's grace we are able to exercise. These include things like love, grace, Mercy, justice, and goodness. But remember, I said these characteristics are passed unto us in a limited way. Now amazingly, the Bible teaches that God can be known. That's astonishing, isn't it? The God of the universe has chosen to reveal himself to us. And He longs for us to know Him more fully, more accurately, and more personally. Now, as a way to make theology, which is the study of God, not just theoretical, we must answer this question. Here it is. How should the knowledge of God change the way I live? You see, God is majestic. And yet I can call him mine. 
I love how the song Indescribable brings these two truths together. Some of the words go like this. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God, incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. What a God we serve. Chip Ingram comments like this. What you think about God shapes your whole relationship with him. And what you believe God thinks about you determines how close you will grow toward him. Let me repeat that. What you think about God shapes your whole relationship with him. And what you believe God thinks about you determines how close you will grow toward him. Here's how I want to say it today. A high view of God leads to holy living. And a low view of God leads to low living. Paul Tripp makes the point that spiritual growth is all about recapturing our sense of awe of the Almighty. He says it like this. We don't have a contentment problem. We have an awe problem. A-W-E. Once awe of God is lost, the loss of heart to obey isn't far off. If awe of God does not grip your heart, the anxieties of this life will likely influence how you live. So let me speak about this for a few moments. God is knowable, yet incomprehensible. Knowable, yet incomprehensible. The Bible is clear that we can have a true and personal knowledge of God, and yet we will never totally understand Him. He is infinite, immeasurable, unquantifiable, uncontainable, unbound, utterly without limit. God is incomprehensible. But this does not mean He is unknowable, but that He is unable to be fully known. Let's read how some of the heroes of the Bible wrote about this. King Solomon, who built the temple of God, wrote in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. He said, Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. King David, in Psalm 139, verse 6, says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And when we come to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul concludes his glorious exposition of the gospel and he breaks out into praise in Romans 11, verse 33 and 34. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? You see, friends, not only can we never know everything there is to know about God, we can never know everything there is to know about even one aspect of God's character or work. And there's some reasons for this I want us to focus on for just a few moments. God is infinite and we are finite. Our minds are affected by sin, and so we are clouded in our ability to know God. Our tendency is to distort, pervert, and confuse the truth, and to use or rather abuse it for selfish ends rather than for God's glory. I want to remind you that God has chosen not to reveal some things. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Now this should cause us to be humble, as we realize we will always have more to learn. 
How do we respond to these truths? We should respond with wonder and awe. Now, having said all of that, I want to come back and I want to say that God has made it possible for us to know Him. Now, there are two ways that people try to know God today. The first one is to use our imagination. Our imagination. You see, each of us carries around a mental picture of who God is. And that picture is a collage of a lifetime of experiences, impressions, and assumptions. The process begins early in life as we observe our parents. Yes, those seemingly all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present beings who rule our homes, for better or for worse. As children, we instinctively project our view of our parents onto our impression of God. As we grow up, other information is added to our imagination of God. These include our experiences with churches, all the sights and sounds and symbols and sermons. As we mature, we keep updating our deity database by accumulating inferences from our teachers, from movies, from music, from current events and from our own observations about life. You see, everyone has an image of God. Some of us view him as a God with a big stick who runs around policing the universe. Others envision a God who just fixes problems. Others imagine a grandfatherly God. Still others view God like a vending machine, thinking He's there just to give us what we want. You see, when we rely on imagination alone, we deceive ourselves into thinking that we really know God when we don't. The second way to know God is through God's revelation. God's revelation. Friends, I want to tell you, our imagination is always inadequate. The only way to know God is for Him to reveal Himself to us. Apart from His revelation, we could never know the things that concern Him, the things that He hopes for, and the things that bring Him joy. Now, thankfully, God has revealed Himself in at least three ways. First of all, through creation. Through creation. In Romans 1 verse 20 we read, For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, talking about people, are without excuse. In Psalm 19 verse 1 we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. But friends, this natural revelation of God is limited. Yes, we can know the power of God by observing His creation, but we cannot know His personality. We can know that He is the Creator, but we will never know His character. While we see evidence for His existence by looking at His world, we won't know what He's like without His Word. And so the second way God has chosen to reveal Himself is through the Bible. Through the Bible. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, we read, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Friends, if you want to get to know God, you do it by getting to know the Bible. If you want to hear from God, you read the Bible. The Bible is bursting with direct statements from God about God, and it reveals His mind, His heart, and His will for us. So God reveals Himself through His world, through His Word, and most clearly, through the Word, His Son, Jesus Christ. God reveals Himself 
through Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, writing about Jesus, we read, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus reveals who God the Father is. Jesus himself said in John 8 verse 19, If you knew me, you would know my Father also. You see, once we get to know Jesus, we get to know the Father. Now let's go back and close with Jeremiah. In Jeremiah's day, the situation was very similar to ours today. People had turned away from God, were trusting in themselves and in their own efforts. And Jeremiah writes and records the words of God in Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You see, we are prone to boast about these three things, aren't we? Wisdom, power, wealth. In Bible times, just like today, the important people included the scholar, the athlete, the politician, the warrior, and the wealthy. If we want to boast or brag, friends, we should tell others that we know God. We are called to know His character. We are called to grow in His characteristics. God is pleased when we practice loyal love. When we stand up for justice, when we live righteously, God is delighted when we know Him and when we grow in Him. Let me summarize it this way. We know that we know God when we grow in God. We know that we know God when we grow in God. Which leaves me with one question. I want to ask you today. Do you know him? Do you know him? J.I. Packer issues a challenge. He says it is possible to know about God without knowing God intimately. This is the danger of sterile intellectualism. It's easy for us to fall into the trap of thinking that since we know a lot of things about God, that we must know him well. I want to tell you today, you can begin a friendship with God. Yes, He's the creator of the world, but He's close to you right now. He sent His Son to die as your substitute so that your sins can be forgiven. Reach out. Reach out and receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord and begin a relationship with God. Friends, you can know God. Let us pray. Now may the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, our friend and our Savior, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our Counselor and our Comforter, be with us and keep us, we pray, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, Amen. Friend, I look forward to seeing you soon. Until then, may God bless and keep you. Goodbye.